Our speaker this afternoon was born right at home here in Iowa City. She has been a lifelong resident and gardener. She remembers her first garden as a victory garden during World War II. I'm sure she was gardening in diapers. <laughs> Mary Lou is a master gardener and is well known for sharing her knowledge and gardening skills with children and adults throughout the Iowa City community. A drive past her home on Greenwood Drive in the spring leaves no doubt where she lives. We are fortunate today to have Mary Lou speak to us about going to pot container gardening. Mary Lou. You want to take those books with you? Thank you. <coughs> when my great grandparents came to Johnson County in the 1830s and homesteaded along Old Man's Creek, the soil was the means of their food source. But in this day and age, 170 years later, we do not need to till the soil in order to eat well. But it seems that man still likes to grow things. And if you don't believe that, go by a high rise and look up at the balconies. And you will see everything from house plants to flowers to vegetables growing on every little bit of allotted space that people have. So when you have no soil, you have poor soil, or you need color in special places, try going to pot. We're going to start out the slideshow with the containers. Picking the right container is very important. The handout that you have is one that I uh, took excerpts from a larger handout from the Extension Service. It's available uh, it's several pages, so I think there's a small charge for it, but it concerns container gardening, it concerns uh, raised beds, and I didn't want all of that, so I sort of uh, took the parts that I wanted. And uh, there's quite a bit of information in there on your flower pots. Where's my button? Here it is. I'm going to talk about wood containers first. The wood containers that you see there are made from just rough cedar. There's no preservative of any kind added to them. And if you're a person like me who doesn't even grow be green, buy green bananas, you don't care if it lasts for 40 years. This will last as long as 15, maybe to 20, with soil. When you put soil next to dirt, you do get rotting. And so uh, there are other, in this handout that you have, they talk about womanized or the treated wood, which uh, according to tests have shown they will last 40 years, which is a long time. Uh, the wonderful thing about the uh, wood containers, you can make them in the shape that you want them in. You do not have the limitations of what you can buy. For instance, this container was one that we created for a problem. I used to work for a lawn care company and they asked me to do flowers in this fast food uh, restaurant. Well, all I could see was people walking out the door, slurping their, their soda and walking right through the, the flower bed. And I could not see that anything was going to last there. But by putting this planter, which is triangular, we were able to have flowers growing and have them not get stepped on. So that's the versatility of using wood that you can make the shape that you want. The other wood that lasts a long time is redwood. And this redwood planter, I think I had for 20 years. I did not uh, get a new one because it had rotted out. I just wanted a new one. You know, we get tired of those same old things. So when I was through with this redwood planter, it was still in very, very good shape as it sat on the front of my, of my step. I went to this type, and I have one here today. It is a... Um, plastic variation. It's kind of insulated. These are the ones that you're looking at here are at my son's house and he did not drill holes in them because he put <coughs> the, the uh, pots of ferns in setting them on an upturned uh, pot so they don't sit on the bottom and he's not going to drown his plant. It, it doesn't run on his porch and make, make a mess. 
because this can be a problem on a wooden porch that you might not want to uh, have the water run on it all the time. But this way, it also offers some humidity for the, the ferns which like that particular thing. Your pots that you see there, you can see at my house, I'm not especially growing those for beautiful pots, but they are available. Those are tubs that, Christmas, that um, trees come in. They're free, they have drainage, they work beautifully, and I use them a lot. In the case of these that are going <coughs> up my steps to the backyard, I am not um, so interested in putting in a design in these containers. <coughs> these are containers I am raising for the flowers. I do press flowers for my garden club and for myself, and so the first pot, the salvia, uh, has you know, about a 10-inch pot. It has maybe eight plants, six to eight plants because the red of this particular bloom does not fade when it's pressed. And so I often think if I need, I need another flower that I have, don't have, I can just stick it in a pot. The next pot that you see going down the, the steps is a bucket. And this was one of my experiments to, I wanted to make holes in the bucket to grow plants out the side. I made them a little too big. So I countered that by cutting a milk carton and slipping that in to close the hole up. The uh, uh, container now works pretty well, but at first, when I poured water in it, it just all ran out those holes. Once the plant gets its roots and gets settled in those little holes, it'll be fine, and that's just a dusty miller. But I want to show you that you don't need to spend a lot of money to end up with containers if you've planted a tree or somebody you know has planted a tree. The containers that I make here are made of what I call lightweight cement. When my daughter-in-law and I were working with um, the rock garden booth, I read a magazine, or I guess it was in Time Life, a recipe for a lightweight cement to make into pots. And we made dish gardens out of these, and they also make wonderful uh, uh, trough gardens, which are very popular right now. The uh, original recipe called for one part each of three different ingredients. One was sphagnum peat. Now this is the brown peat that comes all compressed in bales. It's not black peat. Sphagnum peat, one part. One part of either vermiculite or perlite. Well, we found that the cheapest was really vermiculite, which came in a, uh, you would buy at a um, an, um, lumber yard, and it's just, used for uh, building materials. So this was quite cheap. And then the other was Portland cement. So it was one part of each of those three ingredients. Well, when we first tried them, they didn't hold together well enough. When we were doing these, we had to make them, pot them, haul them to the Project Green sale, and then people had to haul them home. Well, for us, it needed to be stronger. And I'm kind of the person, if a little bit is good, a lot would be better. So instead of going to one and a half parts, we went to two parts. It makes it a little heavier. And for your home use, you might be able to get by with one part of a sphagnum peat, one part of vermiculite, and a part and a half of Portland cement. But we mix them in a wheelbarrow, just like you would do cement, with a hoe. The uh, forms were ones that we... Uh, concocted or found, and the thing we liked the best was a hog water, which is about uh, 10 or 12 inches across and about 5 inches deep. We lined those with plastic, and we tried various ways to uh, uh, treat our form before we came up with this perfection. We used black plastic and vegetable oil, and the vegetable oil may meant that the plastic wouldn't stick, and after uh, two or three days, these just would come right out of the forms. So uh, ideally, we were supposed to do these in the, all our directions. So do them in the fall or do them so that they winter over so you have a time to get rid of some of the materials from that cement. But we usually ended up doing them two weeks before we potted them. So we, it, they, and they grew and they uh, worked fine for us. The one thing you need to remember to do is to uh, make holes when it, the cement is wet. You don't want your cement really sloppy wet or it will fill up those holes. Take a stick and make three little holes, and then after you uh, take them out of the form you may need to just poke those through, but that's important because you want to have drainage. 
most of your hanging baskets are in plastic and these are anywhere from 10 to 12 to even maybe 14 inches across the very large ones the uh, uh, are showing a lot of them with a water reservoir underneath I have one like that and I'm not sure that it took any less water I'm not sold on it yet but uh, that's the theory and most of the planters that you buy the hanging baskets most of them are one uh, plant they all are impatience they all are certain petunia so you don't get a lot of them that are mixed one of my favorite type is this one that I planned uh, for a retirement home that we did and the cocoa bark will dry out faster than plastic so this is something to think about you have to give it more water than you would normally the hanging vine is the vinca vine with a that just has a little white uh, trim on the edge of the leaf and then there's begonias in the in the planter itself this was one that was meant for shade and it's under a, uh, a gazebo at a local retirement home of course the pot that you see the most is the clay pot and the clay pots come in a lot of different sizes and of course the rule too is the bigger the pot the less often you have to water you'll find that the uh, uh, clay pot will require more water than a plastic pot because the clay breathes so to speak and because it breathes you're not as apt to, to uh, um, it breathes air in and moisture out so it does require more but the big pots will go quite a long time and of course they come with drainage and the problem being they do break so there's advantages and disadvantages usually they're a little bit cheaper than some other types of pots then we go to the unique and antique ones and there are many many of these that are great finds this particular one did not have drainage in it it has a pot sitting down inside the, the uh, urn and so I imagine that they pull the urn the pot out water it till it runs through and then put it back maybe let it set for 20 minutes before but it, do, it did not and I've not seen anybody attempt to drill holes in these urns but they could if they really wanted to it depends on who's going to take care of that planter one of my very favorite planters I have favorites that I am showing you and this was one the reason I like it so much is the pot blends with its surroundings it blends with the gray brick and in a container it should not distract from the flowers it should uh, not be the center of interest but it should blend and this is a beautiful blend it has a, a, a fading into the the uh, background and I have liked it what you see in there are um, it looks like a pink snapdragon and the the, the uh, gray is the uh, licorice plant with a uh, uh, green coleus so it uh, the plants are soft colored and they blend together plus the, with the gray getting ready to plant a pot this is a tree tree uh, container a big tree tub and I was doing this about the middle of June because I suddenly realized my daughter wasn't getting her planters planted so this was my idea to do a Christmas a birthday present for her the mix that I'm using is ball mix which Project Green has used for their potting plants for years and years and years I'm one of those people old enough in Project Green to remember when we mixed our own we mixed our own in Gretchen's garage by putting all the ingredients together and stirring them with big shovels and my job was to go to a um, um, mining well not a mining um, to pick up the dolomite dol uh, limestone dolman didn't come out right there you go anyway if we added trace elements we added all the things that went into a potting mix mixed them put them into bags for people thank goodness we found an easier way because I think our nasal passages were filled with that dust for a month after after we did this it was quite a job but I like this mix and I do have a sample showing you what it looks like then I have slow release fertilizer 
it says that it will last four months. Well, it won't last four months in a container. You're constantly flushing the water through. You'll be lucky to get two months, which means you have to take over fertilizing, and you can either add more slow-release fertilizer or you can use a, uh, a uh, moist, uh, one on a folder, or you can use dried. If you use the liquid uh, fertilizer, you'll have to remember to do it once a week or once every two weeks. And since I don't like to do that, I like to use the slow release. You want to be careful if you're replacing your fertilizer in the middle of the summer that you don't burn it because if it's gone two months, it's hot and dry maybe when you're trying to add more fertilizer. So uh, your, your dry fertilizer, unless it's a weak solution, might, might burn your plants. Then I have sitting beside that soil moist, which I like to use in my containers. This, these are crystals that retain moisture. So once they get wet, they will release that slowly and you won't dry out quite as fast. The other thing, because you see the size of that pot, it's not, the roots are not going to go to the bottom of it. And so you will be wanting something lightweight in the bottom. And uh, smashed up milk cartons, three of those work very nice, nicely in the bottom to take up some space, to be lightweight, and so you won't need that much soil. Here I'm showing you, I've gone about within two to three inches of the top, and I have added the amount of fertilizer that's recommended for that amount of soil and the, uh, also the um, crystals for the uh, slow release moisture and fill this with soil and plant and it is uh, this is with a new one if you don't if it's an old one and you're doing it you need to work that in but you want the fertilizer not to be all in one spot so as you dig you will be uh, spreading around the, that fertilizer so you're mixing it up. And when I plant a planter, I use more plants than you could imagine. It's called overplanting. In this pot in the center, to be tall, I have a, a white pintus. I have two drapey plants that'll go over the side, and those are the pale pink petunias. They're a type of a wave, or I don't know with petunia. I'm not sure that they are wave. Then I have some uh, purple ageratum and some white snapdragons. But all told, this pot is probably about 20 inches across and it has a lot of plants in it. This, this is just as it's planted. So over planting, even if you don't have uh, drapey material in your planter, you can, if you fill it with plants, they will just sort of push themselves so it just looks, the ideal look is to be overflowing. The other type of soil that I mix is, uh, because I do alpine plants and I do rock gardens, is I mix my own soil. And this one I'm mixing one part of compost to one part of sand to one part of uh, dirt, just the average dirt. And then I'm putting about a third of the measure of grit. This is for alpine. Alpine plants grow above the tree line. When it rains, the moisture just disappears. And oftentimes it rains every afternoon in the mountains. So this is special soil for alpine. When we had the rock garden booth and we uh, raised plants that needed to have good drainage, we would take uh, four parts of the ball mix, uh, two parts of sand and one part of grit to, to create a soil that drained very well. And that's what we potted our, our little plants in for the rock garden. So there's variations that you can make. If you just went out in your garden and took the soil, dug it up, put it in your planter, it would be as hard as a rock. Because you need air, you need aeration, you need uh, to allow, there's worms in the ground. They'd be saying, why isn't it hard as rock in the, in the garden? Well, we've cultivated it and the worms will loosen it. Heaving and thawing in the winter loosens the soil and you don't get all of that if you try potting it. But it isn't, it isn't I didn't have to sterilize this like you would do pot plants indoors but it was just getting a better composition. This is a little garden that I planted alpine plants in. The alpine plants are kind of fun in the fact that they have, they're very low, short plants. They have small leaves many times and big blooms. And so it's a real fun. The way I winter them, because the plant in its natural setting has a 
two or three feet of snow on it. Here we don't promise anything. We didn't have much snow this year at all. So I pile leaves on it. The leaves are supposed to do that insulation that the snow did. And this year we didn't have rain, so the leaves weren't wet. We had a lot of wind, and it blew most of my leaves off. I'm anxious to see what my alpine plants will uh, think when spring comes. We'll find out. This uh, drainage is so important. The watering of your container should happen from two to four days until you water again. And it's so much better to water thoroughly. Water until it runs clear through the pot. The people will tell me, well, I can't understand why my planter isn't doing very well. I watered every day. Well, if you watered every day, you filled all those little air holes with water all the time, and it's probably drowning. Oh, they never thought about that. You're just watering the, the very, very surface, the top two inches. So a thorough watering less often. And it'll depend on the location of your plant, uh, the wind, the sun, the temperature, all of these things, how often you have to water. But water when it needs it, and the rest of the time, just let it grow. The vegetable that is the most popular is the tomato. And most people will, if they don't have any other planter, they'll have a planter of tomatoes. In my planters, I grow two tomatoes each. And so I'm growing, I have two planters like this. So I grow a total of four tomatoes. Two of them are uh, in um, one of them, I should say, three of them are indeterminate. One is a determinant. Usually I grow a celebrity that just grows, has a big crop, and then it doesn't do much. And the others, you need to have a lot of space to grow an indeterminate tomato because it keeps on growing and it keeps on growing. The thing that you, you're reading about tomatoes is you should change the soil every two years. So if you have them in your garden, well, if you have them in a planter, how do you do this? I changed the soil one time after I'd had it for a couple of years. And now I have put plastic pots that are square in them. And this means this is the second year for that. So I will take it out, completely remove all the soil, sterilize it with Clorox, and put fresh soil back in for another two years. So this is the way that you can get new soil to a tomato plant because of diseases that are born in the soil. The other tomato that's very uh, nice to use is this little patio tomato. The patio tomato has a very, a very thick, healthy stem, and it doesn't even need much staking, but it doesn't have as many tomatoes. It's not as large of a plant. This is, is one that lends itself. And the, the handout that uh, we have tells you about all the things that you can raise. Uh, they go on about beets, carrots, cucumbers, eggplant, green beans, lettuce, parsley, pepper, radishes, spinach, summer squash, Swiss chard, beside the different types of tomato. Um, all of these uh, uh, plants, they didn't mention strawberries. If you've ever um, seen one of these, they can be quite successful. I don't think they're as popular as they used to be a few years back. It's a special clay pot that has pockets in it for tomatoes. And some places you can, uh, you can see them sold. You buy the pot, you buy eight tomatoes that do not send out runners, and you get the soil with it. So it's a complete kit. It's not going to, to produce very many tomatoes, but it would mean that you could probably uh, have strawberries on your cereal for off and on for about two months if you watered and fertilized these. But it's not going to be a big producer. But they are very handsome. And the next most popular thing is herbs. A lot of people will grow uh, herbs in a pot for the simple reason that herbs are terrible to spread in the garden. This means, though, that you also can also maybe bring them in and get a few more months of food from them for seasonings. This is my son's garden who really got into herbs. And instead of putting them in his little raised bed of herbs, he has put a lot of them in pots. This uh, means that it, otherwise it would have taken the whole space, especially if you plant things like um, chives will spread rampantly and your mints are bad spreaders your time will spread. And um, the, growing them in containers is one way to contain them. People ask me if my 
children raise a lot of, are they gardeners after they grew up in my home as gardeners? Uh, all of them have, this one is just recently gone. He's into the fanciest kitchen garden you have ever seen. He has a, a large hoop with tomatoes growing. He has a, a climbing spinach. Uh, he has bean poles and uh, amazing things that uh, he's developed over. So if you go to his house for dinner in the summer, you know you're going to have a very healthy meal. It would be all veggies. <laughs> a lot of veggies are growing here. When we visited, the garden club was in, uh, in uh, Powell Gardens near Kansas City a number of years back. Most of these are growing in about two gallon pots and there's a lot of information. Uh, people ask me, well, why would you want to grow some of these vegetables? They might be something that is your favorite. I also suggest if you are a grandparent and you have a grandchild who is not going to have the joy of planting a seed, watering it, seeing it develop, and growing into something he can eat. This is a wonderful project for you to do with them. Be sure if you start something that they're going to have success. I, I judge 4-H and I talk to uh, young people who are gardeners because I do the, the uh, um, vegetable produce as they bring it in. And the thing that's interesting, if you have a child who does not like vegetables, if he has grown that and harvested, he has an entirely different thought about it. And you'll have kids that'll tell me, I never liked spinach, I never liked uh, tomatoes until I grew them, and now they're my favorite vegetable. Sometimes they have a prejudice if they've tasted them when they're younger, and they just never try them again. So it's a good way to get young people interested in vegetables, and they're, they're attractive as far as that goes. There are cultivars suggested here that are, are bush types instead of long vines. So this is a possibility too. Not everything uh, that we used to have in the garden that took up so much space, it has the same way. They have changed things. So they are available in a bush variety, for instance, a bush cucumber. And if you raise a thing like cabbage and it produces a cabbage head, you can harvest that and use it for a second crop. You could plant green beans or you could put some uh, uh, onion sets in that. But this is just a fun thing and if you miss your vegetable garden and all you have is a patio, unless it's on the north, the one thing about it is the requirement is much greater for anything that blooms. If you have a vegetable that blooms and produces fruit, it's going to want full sun. It'll take at least six hours during in going into the middle of the day. If you have a leafy crop like lettuce or spinach, they can get along with much, much less sun and more shade. And your root crops are kind of in between. So it will depend on where they have the space for their planter, what they can grow. Anything that gets too big, you can always, instead of letting it go down onto the hot cement or blacktop, you can always build a teepee and create a little trellis for it. So it's possible to, to uh, pull those up and get them off of the ground. So this is just some fun things that you might want to do. And uh, so often you say carrots when you're grazing in your own vegetable garden. Carrots are so cheap in the stores. You don't opt to do those. But tomato is something that doesn't taste the same in the store. When they raise a tomato, they have to ship it and it has to be a very firm tomato to hold up. And so there's nothing quite like the tomato that you take right out of your garden. I had never had hanging baskets in my yard because I have a two-story house and the overhang is two stories up, so it's not lends itself to hanging baskets. Never had them until my son was married on the 25th of May in my backyard. Well, the only thing, I have green, I had a lot of green grass. The, I had one huge bed of Dutch iris that was blooming and that was all. The annuals had only been in the ground for about two weeks so they aren't going to be a big show. So the suggestion came to me, why didn't I hang baskets in the trees? And I had both an apple tree and at that time a Washington hawthorn. So by throwing chains over the limbs we were able to uh, get a lot of color. And that was 1986 and I've been growing planters like crazy. In the, in the trees ever since. These I usually get little plugs this time of year, this first week in March. This time of year I go to a nurseryman I know who sells me row or two 
of plugs of impatience. I take them home, pot them up, and by the first week in May, they're ready to go into baskets. So I do all my own baskets, and these, I put maybe four in each pot, and I put a vine that'll come down, and I like to do them all the same. I've had as many as five, so it's four or five of these hanging in the tree, and that can be a pretty big splash of color. I also now have a sunny area where the Washington Hawthorne used to be. It's now a sun garden. And so I not only have a pot on the ground that you see, which is um, a uh, orange perfusion zinnia, and as you go I, directly above it, I have a, an uh, ivy geranium. And then to the right and to the left of the ivy geranium, I have a plant called Million Bells. It looks like it's in the, the family of petunias. And this is one, while we have a determinate tomato, I call this a determinate annual. For me, it did. By September, I didn't have, they, they were just pretty much bloomed out. So I replaced them with something else. But their bloom, for maybe some people, but this is full sun all day. And it, uh, I kept them watered and I kept them fertilized but they just sort of ended. I have the same uh, luck with uh, uh, blue lobelia. It does not, it, by August, it's bloomed out. So I call it a determinate veg flower. Straight above is a uh, yellow uh, straw flower, and it bloomed and bloomed. You have to keep it deadheaded. This is uh, fairly early in the year, so it isn't too awfully big at this time, but it was a, a blaze of color. If you're hanging your basket under an overhang. Remember, it's not going to get the real rain. And as you know, that real rain, there's nothing quite like it. The real rain is the one that, that um, you can water and water and water and it gets rain and everything just pops. So if you know it's going to rain, you can set it out. Or, but you, you know when you put it under an overhang, you have to provide most of the moisture. So this was uh, the case of this one in the gazebo. Also, remember that the sun is a different angle. This was taken in September at the uh, Lion Club uh, tour, garden tour. In the summer, that overhang shaded them pretty much midday. But this time of day, this time of year, it is going to get more sun. It's not as strong. But think about that, too. The nice thing about container gardening is you can move them as the year progresses. You can move them to a better place. You can um, turn them around. If they're getting sun on one side, you can turn them around. This is something you cannot do in your garden. It's possible to just make a whole wall of color with containers. These are hanging baskets. There are planters that are on little stands down below. There's a little clay pot. There's a now, there's a hanging basket that didn't even get a place to hang. It's sitting on a post. But by using containers, you can just really do a big mass of color. And I have several places in my slideshow that show you that, how, it, how you can get. This is another place. A lot of color can be had by hanging plants. Now, they have a couple of baskets hanging under the deck. And then they have the sack. That's another type of a container. They were very popular about six years ago or more, I don't know, six or seven. This is a sack with holes in it, and you want to plant a very prolific bloomer in it. You want to plant one that's just going to cover the whole sack. And of course, impatience do meet that requirement. Friends don't let friends buy annuals. That isn't true. If we didn't use annuals, we would not have a color all summer. Annuals are the basis of our color in our planters, in our yards, and everything because they are very, very, very prolific bloomers. Other than that, perennials, the average perennial blooms three weeks. And you stagger them so you keep getting bloom, but the same plant takes up that space and it doesn't give you that much flower. So that is not true. You do need to buy annuals. This is one of those spectacular things. Actually, we saw this in Omaha in a greenhouse on a garden club trip. These are three containers hanging above each other, planted with impatience. And because impatience is, I say, this prolific bloomer. 
Every woman on that garden club trip looked at this and thought, how can I take this home? <laughs> uh, we couldn't put it on your lap because it would be uh, stacked on top of each other. All we could take home from this was the idea. And I don't know if any of them tried putting three containers above each other and planting, but it was, it was really a big, big splash. Another yard that shows how they, they, so often when people will put this masses together, they put all colors, just like a perennial garden. They put yellow with red with pink. There are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven containers hanging on the house. And there is at least two planters sitting next to the house besides things that are growing in the ground. So this is a big, big splash of color, all growing in, in containers. You can make a big splash with one color also. Uh, I don't ever tell you which one. I, I like them all. I like all colors, and I like the, the uh, single color. But these are two window boxes and one planter below, just planted with red geraniums that are kept blooming and blooming. And speaking of keep blooming, if you want any of your plants to keep blooming, most of them you have to deadhead. Deadhead is taking off that spent bloom. The pattern of an of a plant is it goes from seed to a plant to a bloom to seed. And what you are going to do is interrupt that going to seed so it goes back to, to seed again and not, uh, not uh, quit blooming because it's taking all its energy to grow seeds. So when you have geraniums and they just start to fade, don't wait till they're, the whole plant has all of the, the blooms uh, dead and uh, blown away and going to seed, just the minute one of them starts, cut it off and you will continually get bloom. Geranium, if you leave it all go to seed, they're going to be a, a, a lull in your bloom. So be on the, the stick about going out there and chopping off the dead ones as soon as they occur. And I think you'll be well rewarded because you'll get much, much more bloom. Here's another case of using a big, big, big splash. This is the big splash that you get from um, all one color. This is the petunia, but here is it's petunia and a geranium. There is a white geranium up there. This was in a hosta garden that we saw, and it really gave a bright bit of color. This is my uh, window box, and my window box is about six years old, and I put different things in it every year. This particular year, the um, uh, Snapdragons is something I discovered. I love my little red snapdragons. They are another thing that when I grow a tall snapdragon, by the time the whole stalk is done blooming and snip it off, it seems like it delays the next bloom. The little dwarf ones, I snip them off just as soon as they finish, and I can almost keep them just consistently blooming all summer long. Now, these are the little red and white uh, snapdragons. The um, <laughs> Purple heliotrope is one that I've had every year. This is the south window in my living room, and it's got inside there are two uh, very comfy chairs that we sit in a lot. And if we have an evening that we can open the windows, which in Iowa you not, can't always do. A lot of nights it's air conditioning on. But if you can open the windows, the heliotrope will fragrant the whole living room almost. So it's always had that, and this has got just white geraniums. I'll show you another picture of it when it was, this is talk over planting. Uh, I have three plants of the uh, small leaf licorice plants. I have three, two plants of blackie, the uh, sweet potato plant. I, ha I know I have three heliotrope and I have three pink geraniums. I don't know how many little pink dwarf ones I have. I also have a couple of um, bacopas in there, but this is what you call over planting. There's some upright things, but a lot of, of draping plants all together in that planter. I like this color scheme a lot. This was growing in full sun at the Chicago Botanic Gardens. And I looked and I thought, what are they growing caladiums in full sun? Well, they do all right if you give them enough water. But I love the little planters they have above. They have about four plants in both of, in all three of those. There's the uh, little drape over plant is a pink lobelia. The uh, white 
begonia and pink begonia are there's like two whites and one pink in the lower ones the top looks like there's two lobelia and two pink wax begonias but they're overplanted and they're overflowing and they were just beautiful the chicago botanic garden had this they call this the the handicapped area because things were up high and i think people tended them and we also saw this there and this is petunias there were two like window boxes hanging above each other and the petunias were so prolific and so overflowing that they hid the the containers entirely so you're, if you want lots of bloom in the sun the petunia is your top uh, bet your lots of bloom in the shade has got to be the the impatience this does not have bloom to speak of this is a composition it has all of the the factors of um, elements of design it has balance proportion because it's a big big container it has to be a big tall plant it has scale the um, elephant ears are large large leaf you could not put those in a lot of of different planters it has rhythm it repeats things through through the container the dominance is supposed to be that pink bloom from the angel wing begonia but in this case it happens to turn out to be the pink sign that told us what was there <laughs> It was fouled up. And then you have contrast. The, the contrast of the smooth leaf with the rough leaf. And uh, it, was, it was sitting there for our purpose. And we are going into these gardens when we're being toured. So they're planning it for us. One of my favorite color schemes is the monochromatic color scheme. This is a planter at the Riverside Gardens in Monticello. If you go through 151, be sure and take time to stop. They have this wonderful pink coleus, they have pink geranium, a red coxcomb, a white, ger I think it was a white snapdragon, I don't know for sure, and in the front is the red and white um, dwarf snapdragon again. But a monochromatic color scheme is several shades of reds or pinks, and uh, it's probably one of my favorite. If you go ideally, this might have, this planter might have to have a little more height, but I won't argue that, I just love the color of it. The containers outside the uh, University of Minnesota, Missouri, Montana, ah, University of Minnesota Botanic Gardens at Chanhassen are always planted in a color scheme. The color scheme this particular year was gray, white, and lavender. They, they had them, all the flower beds were planted. They used a lot of heliotrope in some of the other planters and I was probably there in September because that's usually when I don't get there until about then. And I have a brother in Minneapolis, so this is a good uh, stop when I go up. But there, it's always a fun, fun place if you ever have a chance to go. And these are, uh, I think there were about 10 planters altogether planted like this. If you go on Project Green Tour, you get ideas. And from ideas come things you want to do in your garden. The uh, planters next to the, to the door offer you a softening. It, it identifies the back door. But many back doors come out onto either a deck or cement. And they're not usually something we fuss with too much. This, uh, because they have the petunia that matches the petunia that's planted. There's a lissom petunia and purple salvia in the ground planting. But I came home from this and immediately created a planter for me. My, my, this is my first one. It's kind of, this is in uh, June we're doing this. And so I happened to have a grapevine wreath basket that I hadn't used. So I put a pot in that. I planted the pot that sat on the stool and I put the one in front. And from that, then I started, it, it evolved. The next year, my husband built me little stands so it would drain nicely from the planters. And I tried the million bells here, and they got tired in, in September. I saw in the magazine where they put um, bamboo stakes in for uh, something to climb on, and they uh, used copper wire and uh, put beads on the top. Well, I thought it was a great idea, and I made this. And my diplodenia was supposed to go up that. All summer, it just sat there, and it didn't go up there. And... Uh, I, I don't know why, it, it just is very reluctant to, 
to uh, grow very fast. And everybody told me, oh, they'll just be huge up there. Well, it went up there a little more this time. Now I had the bamboo in the ground two years, and it rotted out. So this is uh, my new uh, trellis is a wood trellis, which I put in last year. And I, the planter is now a three huge tubs. I have um, a wave petunia on a, a little iron stand. And it, is, of course, did its thing. So I'm getting some height, which is what I wanted. I didn't want it to be so low. So my pots are about, um, I measured them. They're about 24 inches. The two in back are 24 inches across. So they're big, big tree tubs. I have uh, pink geraniums in them. I have a pink geranium in the front that is a sprawling geranium. It's the first year I'd ever raised it, and I really recommend it. It was very, very wonderful. I have uh, some gray dusty miller. I think I got some silver leaf because I wanted to press it, so I put that in. That's dead center in the, in the big one with the trellis. The uh, gray is uh, my small leaf licorice plant, and draping down the front is my favorite sweet potato plant, and this is variegated, and I've got a sample of one here. It isn't as vigorous as the other. The others get huge, and you almost have to cut them back. But I, uh, oh, I overplant all the things I can. My little rock there should have been pulled out. We painted rocks in Garden Club, and my little rock says, I love flowers, and I don't think I need to tell people. <laughs> <laughs> this is a... A uh, very beautiful grape uh, grouping that I saw in Door County. And this is a lot of houseplants. This is, I call it an Aurelia. I'm not a houseplant person, so I may not have the right names on things. It has um, some coleus, but it has some Rex begonias in it. So it's got texture, but it's the grouping of plants by the back door, which otherwise would just be kind of a, a blah entrance to the house. So this is a nice idea to dress up your back door and group things together. These are grouped in a, a tour that we had. The um, uh, impatients are just all in black pots, setting all together. Apparently, across the alley was a view this person didn't want, so he built a fence. And then he dressed up the fence. And no matter how many of the gorgeous orange uh, impatients that he put, the, the highlight to that garden is still a beautiful hosta that you see there because it's, it's light color and it comes at you. But grouping is very, very easy to do with containers that you can just put a mass of things together. And these were all on tiers. Speaking of grouping, this is a, we were traveling through Monticello at a fast food restaurant and we were going out and I said, stop, I got to get a picture of this. <laughs> the, the thing that I liked about it was if, that, if you would have planted impatience down on the ground, they wouldn't have been near as dramatic as putting them up and putting four of a kind. But the first thing I thought was, they have somebody in this restaurant who religiously waters these because they're wax begonias and they're like the, the impatience. They do not like to dry out. So somebody was very diligent in keeping these watered, but the emphasis was on having the four alike. And it drew your your eyes if you needed to have. But it was very hot in, in this cement. There was a lot of uh, heat coming off of it. So a lot of plants wouldn't do well there. I found this little old antique planter in uh, a trip that we took uh, to Minnesota last summer. And they did not put blooming plants in. They just had sweet potato plants. And it looks like two, it's going to be way too many when it gets big because we were there in June. The uh, two that are chartreuse, called Marguerite, and then the one in the center is called Blackie. They actually grow a sweet potato. I have never eaten one, but I thought about it. I could maybe, you could maybe eat it. A garden that needs a center of interest would really benefit from a beautiful white wagon. The, uh, there's a huge backyard that was a wonderful perennial garden around the edge, but this old antique wagon in white had some uh, petunias and some draping things from it with a tub setting in it. So I'm going to show you some really different and unique um, containers. Another little old wagon. This one was in Rockford, Illinois on a tour. And it, the whole antique, it looks like that woman behind ought to be in an old-fashioned dress because you see 
the stone wall, it looks like uh, pioneer days and seeing the old wagon. But instead of just letting that be a black plastic tub that held those flowers, they put the uh, burlap around it, which softened it and made it look like it was of the times. The smoke stand came into use. It's got two, two uh, pots of impatience in a um, hosta garden that we saw in Des Moines. But you, because it's such a prolific bloomer, we can't see much of the smoke stand, which is fine. At least it was dark that you couldn't see. A vine that I've used and liked a lot is this uh, German ivy. I usually have to prune part of it out. This one, I can put one little plant that big in May when I plant my planter. This is a planter my boys made. This is, I have had, they, well, the youngest one has been out of high school for 30 years. It isn't the same planter. My husband had to duplicate it. But one Mother's Day, they got the notion they would make this like a horse, they call it the horse trough. And they found a pitcher pump at the, pump at the farm and attached it to a board across and uh, brought it to me for a planter. And I have loved it ever since. It's had all kinds of different plants in it. But with soil direct contact, it lasted, I think, about 20 years. And I don't even know if they used uh, rough cedar. But the one that we've rebuilt is rough cedar. And uh, soil does, does rot wood eventually. But that's one of my favorite plant vines to use in it. The other vine that's just very, very prolific, and it's covered up this planter. These are two iron tubs that were left. The only thing left when our locker burned were these two iron pots that they cooked lard in. They were, are about uh, 24 to 30 inches across. And I thought my husband would really balk when I asked him if he would drill holes in it. Didn't phase him at all. We, we have holes in it. But you can't see the pots because the... The Bacopa vine, I put too many in there, I think, has just completely covered them, but they're black. This particular container, or spot for a container, doesn't get full sun. This, to the west is this uh, uh, magnolia tree, which does a lot of uh, shading, and it doesn't always get full, it doesn't get sun from the early morning from the house. So I imagine, I don't know how much sun it gets. But geraniums, this is the thing that fools you. Geraniums are supposed to be full sun. One of the first things I did on my job is I went to uh, a bank that on the east and trees completely shaded the east side of the building. And they had growing there red geraniums. And I thought, well, they can't grow there. There's not enough sun. Obviously, the geranium never read the book because they were growing there. And they did very well there. So how do you know if you have not enough sun, the plant will get leggy and not bloom. So, so sometimes they have a wider tolerance of light than we know. So try them. That's all. Gretchen Harshberger used to always tell us, why don't you try it and see? And so that's how you find out if you have enough sun for certain plants. Trough gardens are coming into a very popular use. This particular one was in a hosta garden and it even had a little hosta in it. It has a uh, dwarf, it looks like, I don't know what exactly is in it. I put uh, succulents in mine, but wouldn't you know, I made one when we had a workshop, and the only picture I could find of it is that little thing off down there to the left. Do you see my, my, uh, that is my trough. And it's not a very good picture, but the one thing that's nice about it when it's with my by all my stone, it sort of blends in. So that's got something going for it. And it, um, it is made out of this lightweight cement and it has a drainage and so forth. And we just built a box the, the size we wanted, and put the black plastic in to make the lightweight cement. Here are the dish gardens that we made. Jane and I, my daughter-in-law, made these for, I don't know, 12 years or so for the rock garden booth every spring. And what we planted them with was more uh, the succulents and hen and chickens. We usually took a piece of driftwood for a focal point for the center. And these, of course, by the summer's end, the, uh, in, the sedum will be more overflowing and much larger. These were just planted and not really filled out. And of course, the hens and chickens will spread too. But they must be in a, 
in a soil that drains very well. Covering a fence is a, weight, a wonderful thing to, to uh, decorate with planters. And these are, the first thing I thought when I saw this one too was, oh, they have to, these are clay pots and they're small. They have to be watered often. This, this is, as a person who tends a lot of planters, this is uh, the first comment that comes. But while it was built for a privacy fence, isn't it much nicer to have it decorated? This wall would be kind of ugly without. It is a retaining wall out of railroad ties, which might be kind of rough looking. But this uh, man who uh, decorated the backyard put matching planters of red and white petunias times five, which is nice that he repeated that. But you don't see the ugly wall, you see the pretty planters. So this gives you ideas of places to use them. Novelty planters. I saw this when I was driving around and so I thought I gotta go back and take a picture of that. When I went back to take a picture of it, I found out they weren't real flowers. <laughs> <laughs> Which for a flower lover to me that, that was bad. <laughs> but I took the picture anyway because they could have been. <sighs> Another real interesting uh, container was this horse that was built. We saw this on the tour and they didn't put dirt in it so it would rot it out. They put pots in it. But it was, it was cute. It was, we went to a place called Burwood Hill Inn and it was a bed and breakfast in southern Minnesota for lunch. And knowing I was having this show this summer, spring, I was all summer taking, taking pictures of every container I could find. The place had about 30 antique urns all plotted with wonderful, wonderful plants, most of them in the sun. I was snapping pictures all over the place and found out that my lens was sticking and they were all overexposed. So someday I've got to go back and take some more pictures because it was a very neat place. This one is uh, kind of in the light and dark so it didn't have as bad a problem. This isn't so much the container as the setting for it. The, the container is just a pot put in a basket, but it's got green and white for its main features. It's setting on a white bench with a green and white pillow. So it's, it's the setting that they, uh, is so dramatic and pretty about this. I don't, they knew we were coming and it was set up just for us. I know, they probably don't leave the pillow out there and they may not even have the planter there normally, but it was still very attractive. This is something that's in my neighborhood and the lady who tends it is physically impaired and because the bed is raised and she has two pots and she has planters on the railing, she's able to keep this, uh, this was taken last September, keep this just a beautiful spot and I think of how much satisfaction she gets out of it, but I know that the people that that travel on the sidewalk across the street get to really enjoy it, so it's beautiful. A deck can be up and above, away from your garden. And in this case, this deck was, was on a tour that we were in Project Green. The perennial garden was at the back of the yard and they were removed from it. You had a green space and this beautiful perennial garden. This, by having hanging baskets and all these plants sitting, it brought the flower garden to you. And so it was a much more enjoyable thing to set out on this deck with all these blooms. And also when you, some of those are in little pots. If you group them together, it's much easier. You, your hose can get several at one time. So this is another thing to think about is to group them together. Where do you get ideas for new plants? Well, the same catalogs that sell seeds sell ideas. And so uh, a lot of times you can see new things that people are using. The uh, White Flower Farm has a picture of something I've been looking for that I've got to, brought to you. So this is the idea you get. Uh, not everything you put in your garden are annuals, but some in Iowa they are annuals, and this is a fuchsia plant. If you have a greenhouse, you can easily keep it over. It's not really a perennial, I mean an annual, but you have to have the right spot for it. I have a friend who envies my spot for fuchsia because it turns out I it has the right amount of shade, the right amount of sun, and uh, I've had beautiful fuchsias there for a number of years. 
they haven't always been for him, so he's envious. I did this little planter for my daughter. The, the pot itself is only 10 inches across. In the back of the pot is a penicetum rubrum, or the annual red grass, red fountain grass. There are four plants of a coleus that is a sun coleus, and one sweet potato plant. If your sweet potato plant gets so big as this marguerite did, you can whack it off. My daughter set it on a plastic uh, milk carton holder because it, it, it was going to the, to the uh, and then also on your deck, it, it drains better if it's setting up again. But this, this was one of the things that I thought was very successful. I really liked. My wave petunia outdid itself. There's always a question is to deadhead petunias. You cannot deadhead a petunia unless you spend your whole life doing that. <laughs> Deadheading is not for petunias. I've had to argue with so many people on this. Twice a year in the summer, I whack off the ends. And for about a week, it's low on bloom. But by that time, it's all back growing again. That keeps it from getting leggy, and it sort of restarts it. But there's no way you could deadhead and keep up, because I'd be out there all the time. And I'm not going to do that. I also found this was very important to deadhead. This is a, a sprawling verbena. I have um, one of a sp sprawling, sprawling verbena in my plant here, but I didn't, couldn't find a red one. It's a purple one. I will like the red better because purple is a color kind of recedes, and you have to put white with it to make it flashy. This verbena was deadheaded probably every two weeks. And it just then just came back and bloomed and bloomed and bloomed. And this is the end of my uh, horse trough this year, and I had the, this vine instead of my German ivy. I had the uh, small leaf licorice plant. One of my favorites, because this is a monochromatic color scheme again, and it's got all the height, it's got all the right things, is this planter that was growing. It's a wood, it's like a, a wood whiskey barrel, but it's out of wood that's not a whiskey barrel, it's an imitation. It was growing at the state fair. If you only have an hour at the state fair, go to the, to the uh, garden that the master gardeners tend there. There's lots of good ideas and lots of fun plants growing. And this was very pretty up there. People ask me, can you grow perennials in your pot? Yes, probably. Uh, hosta is so tough, you probably won't even have a lot of problems. I think in my insulated uh, pot that I have there, maybe you could. But my experience when I'm trying to grow a perennial, trying to grow herbs or other type of perennial in a, in a pot, if I will pile the leaves up as far as the, the uh, top and put a little fence around to hold those leaves in, it'll work. What you're missing is the heaving and thawing of above ground plant. The ground will insulate when it's sitting and when it's planted in the normal manner. But planted in a planter above the ground, you do get the heaving and thawing. And this is, seems to be what... In the case of a uh, hosta, you could probably dig it up and stick it in your ground over the winter and put it back in. Or I'd stick it in the corner, pile some leaves around it, and leave it. I don't know. don't know if anybody's had experience doing that. This is something I'm still looking for. <coughs> I found they, the uh, tall plants that you see here are called cabbage tree. Well, that's not the botanical name, but the, uh, that was the common name. And I found in a magazine, uh, a reddish one. The difference between it and the spike, your spikes are, are used for heights, and most of your planters, you do need heights, but your spike all come up from the ground, and all your leaves are that length. Where this comes up in branches and comes up in branches, so it's, it's a larger, taller, uh, spiky type thing to use in a container. Haven't found it yet, but that's what I'm looking for. This is one that I tried. I... Um, um, I have one of them over here that is in a different color. It uh, is called, oh my goodness, let me see here. <laughs> Angelona, I think. Angel Mist, there it is. Angel Mist was the common name. Angelona was the botanical name. Angelona Augustifolia. And Augustifolia always tells you something. That's a, a Latin name that tells you it likes it hot and dry. It likes August. This little plant was supposed to be 
in a, on a planter with my polka dot plant, but the problem was there was too big of a gap in the size. The thing kept growing and growing and growing and growing and blooming. This gives you a close-up of the bloom. I, I used it to press, but it, it's okay to press. It wasn't the most exciting thing, but it just kept going up this stalk, and it got much taller. I have a, one that's called uh, Angolia Blue for this year. I don't know where I'm going to put it or how I'm going to use it. But uh, I do know that um, the uh, uh, plant got awfully big, awfully tall, and um, wasn't, it didn't go with the pot. So it wasn't, it wasn't too uh, flashy where I used it. So I'm going to try again. So if you're thinking about gardening this summer and you want to try containers, be sure it's the right size container and you have good drainage. Use quality potting mix. Try slow release fertilizer and, and soil uh, retention crystals in order to cut some of your work down. Uh, Overplant if it's a flower. Provide the right light. And remember, annuals live fast and die young. And that means that they live fast, they're going to use a lot of water, they're going to use a lot of fertilizer. So you have to compensate for that in your container by meeting those needs. No matter what age you are, we hope you'll always want to keep on growing. Where do you get your two-ball soil mix? Where do I get my two ball two soil mix? Oh, yeah. soil mix? Um, I have to, usually I don't, I don't want to recommend any one person over the other, but I know where I get it. I, I was thinking last uh, year when I was buying my plants, I could go through about 12 different uh, merchants and I bought things at everybody's. So I'm not recommending anybody over the other, but I know what's available. And Joyce's Greenhouse does carry the uh, ball two mix, and we just got a new big bag. It comes in 40 pounds, and I, it's about $12. So it's very reasonable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How much water do you add to make cement dishes? That's something that you just tell us right. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like putting flour in your bread. You put it until it's just right. You put in some, and if you wonder if this is going to hold up, then start making your uh, form, and if it is too dry, but you don't want to get it too wet. That's the one thing. And you want to be sure you can work quickly when you, because it's, it's cement, and it will, you want to be able to put that into a form or do something with it out of your uh, wheelbarrow. Mm -hmm. Where do you get by the grit? The grit, you have to go to um, a feed company. They feed grit to chickens because chickens don't have teeth, and they have to have grit to grind their food. And it's crushed uh, oyster shells. And it's, it's a feed company. I used to go to Gringers, and Gringers isn't anymore, so I don't know. Tell us how to sterilize soil with Clorox. I didn't sterilize the soil with Clorox. I was sterilizing the container. In my tomato planter, I have square tubs. If I take all the soil out of that, I will put a very strong solution of Clorox in and soak it in there. And usually, if you're, uh, I sterilize with Clorox in my uh, uh, orchid uh, watering. And in this case, I don't measure. I guess it's maybe a fourth of a cup to a quart. It's pretty strong. Mm -hmm. Nine parts water to one part bleach. There's, there's somebody that do it. Yeah, there you go. I have several large containers, larger than the one that you have up in front. <clears throat> and I'm wondering how to prepare the existing soil each year. Can I reuse it? How much should I throw or recycle? What should I add? I um, usually, with my, my, with my hanging baskets, I dump them completely every two years. This was the year I dumped them all, so I have to fill all of those. With my big planters, I will scoop out uh, perhaps um, 
two to three inches off the top and put new soil in. And after I do that, this is my opportunity to put in the slow release crystals like you saw when I was planting because I was going to add more soil to that, that picture as you saw. It was going to have more soil in there to plant. But I, um, I don't change the soil in the big planters every year. It's every two years. So this is the year the planters, I will scoop out two to three inches and put in fresh soil. And that soil that I scoop out, I <coughs> sprinkle in my compost pile. And everybody should have a compost pile. This person wants you to talk a little bit about the sweet potato plant. <coughs> and do you plant one? Sweet potato plant. You plant one, you will be just overflowing. <laughs> um, the particular one that I bought here to show you is not quite as prolific. It doesn't get as big. This is the variegated one, and I don't know. For me, it never has. The marguerite, which is a chartreuse one, and the blackie, oh, they'll get yay long and lots of different spikes on them. So they really are very, very huge plants. But with any plant, it's your plant. Cut some of it off if you don't want it. You don't, just because mm -hmm. it gets that big, you don't have to leave it, mm -hmm. which a lot of people think, oh, gosh, it's just huge. Well, cut it off if it gets too huge. Right. We have a second-story deck that runs across the back of our house. It faces south, so it's sunny, hot, and windy. What type of annuals would work best in this situation? Sunny, hot, and windy. <laughs> <coughs> well, I think anything like your petunia, petunias are very tough. You want something that uh, thrives in hot weather. Your um, um, Neambergia loves it hot. Your uh, Dahlberg daisy loves it hot. Mm -hmm. It's things, if you find anything that says Augustifolia on it, your, um, there's a Xenia Augustifolia. That would like it. That would, the, num the one, I think they're calling it White Star now the uh, mm -hmm. Xenia Augustifolia. All of those really thrive in the heat. Mm -hmm. Things that do not like it hot, uh, your um, alyssum doesn't like it hot, your snapdragon doesn't like it hot, so the August is not a good month for that. The uh, salvia does not like it hot. Mm -hmm. Those are things that might not do well for you to bloom out straight through. Mm -hmm. What would a geranium do in that situation? Geranium is fine. Geranium is probably the most adjustable. They, as they can go in part shade, they can grow. They like it hot. They don't want to be overly wet. They want good drainage. But I, I raise my geraniums in cement around them and full sun, and they do. They're fine. Can you grow a cilantro from seed uh, through the winter? If so, how? Well, you probably can start it. Through. I've never started cilantro through, through the winter. If you, anything that you want to start, it'd be better if you had lights because once your little plant starts to grow, if you're depending on the window, they get tall and leggy, they go for the light. So if you grow them under fluorescent lights, they will get bushy and will be a better plant. And cilantro would, I would assume, grow like anything else. I haven't tried it. My son hasn't asked me to raise that yet. What is the best shade flower? The best shade flower is impatience. <laughs> and this, you want bloom, bloom, bloom. If you want other things, there are a lot of things that are pretty. Caladium is a beautiful bulb <coughs> to grow in the shade. The thing about your caladium, it likes it warm. If you set a caladium out and it's cold, it'll just sit there for the longest time. It doesn't do anything. Mm -hmm. It wants to have a very warm uh, nights and days when it goes out. Mm -hmm. The caladium and likes more. Coleuses. Maybe. And the coleus, the coleus is not as, they do well. They have a, coleus is the big plant. I think it's the fastest growing number of, of cultivars that are coming back is in the coleus. It's a big uh, push mm -hmm. right now for coleus. How do you keep fuchsias blooming in hot Iowa weather? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't. My, my friend who can't grow fuchsia just doesn't even like to look at mine. Uh, I've had very good luck having it there. It gets some a late afternoon sun. It's under an apple tree, so it's filtered sun, mostly shade the mm -hmm. rest of the day. I have no idea. I just keep it watered and keep it fertilized. and It's happy. And it's happy, yeah. I never argue with success, but I don't know why it's happy. Because 
Years ago, I tried them and tried them, and I never could get it to do anything. This person also has a southern exposure, no shade, in shallow rectangular pots on a deck rail. Mm -hmm. There again, so. your, your hot, hot plants would be, uh, your geranium could grow, your petunias would grow, um, the uh, neambergia would do well, the Dahlberg daisy would do well. Mm -hmm. How about vinca? That, uh, that... Vinca is a very, there's three plants you don't need to deadhead. Vinca, wax begonias, and impatience. So that's a big plus right there. Vinca, it will never give you as much overflowing bloom as some of the other plants. But it will grow in shade, it will grow in part shade, it will grow in full sun. Okay. The secret of any of these plants that normally like shade, if you put them in sun, you've got to be sure you give them enough moisture. Would you ever think about planting a, a perennial in a situation like that, like maybe an artemisia? In, well, yes. in, in the sunny pot? Yeah, or in, in a, a sunny pot, yes. This is, you're seeing this more and more. People are using perennials in pots. If they don't grow the next winter, the next year, that's fine, you know. They, mm -hmm. But you're seeing, um, I've seen a lot of pots that had small trees, little shrubs, evergreens, and various things. I don't know what they do with them in the winter. Mm -hmm. They don't tell me that. All uh, right, now, now we need to think shade for a minute. Can you suggest shade-tolerant plants for a north-facing brick patio? There again, your impatience, your caladiums. Um, in, in shade, your vinca, and you can grow vinca there, you can grow wax begonias. If you grow wax begonias in the sun, they have more color than they do. They're paler. Mm -hmm. But all three of those will grow in a, in a shady. And would, would you do hostas? If you, if you want to put hostas in, hostas are so tough that sometimes people will throw them aside and forget about them and a month later pick them up and plant them and they still do well. They, they might do fine in planters. I haven't grown them in planters. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is there some worry about discoloring or rotting of a deck when pots are on it and mm -hmm. drain out onto the deck? Mm-hmm, mm -hmm, there is. <laughs> You'll get, uh, this is why raising them <coughs> from it so it don't set right on it is, is putting a couple of boards under it, getting it above so it, it, it'll drain, it'll dry faster. Mm -hmm. And you may want to move it. You may get some staining and you may uh, have it rot. Of, uh, not most of those things. If they're made of womanized, uh, treated wood, they aren't going to rot. Mm -hmm. But you will get some staining. Mm -hmm. You have to decide yes. and then they want. They do sell those little legs, don't they? In some yeah, of the, they sell the legs. for clay pots. Mm -hmm. And you could put them above, you could put a pot under them and raise them above so it caught the water, and then you could dump the water if you really didn't want it stained. If you mm -hmm. really want to work at it, you could work at it. What do you do to keep out rabbits? Well, you encourage the neighbor's cats to come to your house. <laughs> cats. I have a question. Um, I have a place next to my house where I would like to plant um, a climbing plant because there's a trellis there, and underneath it I have a I have a, a wooden box, a planter, and I can pick I can pick that planter up and carry it someplace else, even though during growing season it's attached to whatever's climbing up the trellis, mm -hmm. so I can't move it. Mm -hmm. Now, when winter comes, and I let's say I let's say I can find a shade tolerant clematis that I love in that spot. I'm a kind of afraid to leave it there because it's a perennial all winter. Do I, do I protect it, as you said, with straw or would, something like I that? Or do a, I would put uh, insulation around it. You probably need <coughs> to put a little chicken wire cage to mm -hmm. hold that in there, mm -hmm. straw and leaves. Would you ever move it? We have a little garage under the, under the underground. Could I move it in there where it's not? Could it go inside, in other words, if it's a protective place? I wouldn't put it inside. I think it's it'd cold. Really it's cool, yeah. but it just isn't freezing no. down there. No, I wouldn't do that. Okay. <laughs> it's too much okay. Work. Okay. <laughs> I, I'll just draw. <laughs> yeah. I'll just draw. Okay. Colette Pogue has done us a, a favor by bringing this uh, catalog uh, from New Mexico. And she says that this is just a great catalog. And she has this one copy left. She wants to give it to someone who has a sunny garden, a very sunny garden, because there are things in here that she says will survive here in Iowa, and she wants someone else to enjoy this catalog. So would you raise your hand if someone has a very sunny garden and would like to have this for a reference? Or here we go. And I'm going to 
and I need to talk about my okay. plants. Oh, now you're going to plant, or what are you going to do? You're no, going to just talk, talk to, about. Okay, Mary Lou, they're going to talk about plants, and I'll get out of here. Okay, I, I brought this pot because I do think this is going to be a, a neat thing to use. You notice that it has two, three holes in it, so it's not going to have a problem with drainage. The um, what I brought to go in it. Oftentimes you get these packing things, you don't know what to do with them. If you're not saving the box, I cut it up and put it. It's going to take up space, but it's lightweight. It's not going to add any weight, and I won't need as much soil to go in here. You can also use the crushed milk cartons, and I recommend those. Some of you have wandered up here and fagging spilled my dirt. Um, <laughs> I have here the uh, mix that is for the Alpine Garden, which is very, you can feel it's very gritty. I have the ball mix. Uh, I have the picture that I found in the um, White Far Flower Farm catalog that has this, this is called a cabbage palm, and what I saw in, in uh, the Minnesota Arboretum was the cabbage tree. It looks like the same family. They tell me at the nursery that the big thing this year is going to be using millet, where you have used the purple um, or the, the red grass that's an, that we base here is annual, the red fountain grass or rubrum, that this is uh, going to replace that for some people. It's got kind of a corn-like growth, and um, it actually it says it's a, it's a penicetum, glaucum, so I have no idea. Um, they hadn't started the seed yet at the nursery that I asked for it for yet, so I'm a little bit early. I brought the osmocote, which is a brand name, for vegetable um, and bedding, but this plant food is 14, 14, 14, which is just a, a balanced uh, amount of fertilizer. And I bought the soil moist. Now this little thing is $13.49, but it goes, I didn't even use it all. It goes a long way. This is the, the, it tells you the amounts to use for the amount of soil, and it holds moisture in your plant. The first time I put it in, I thought it said, Tablespoon that said teaspoon, I put in a tablespoon, and it swelled up till it almost went over the pot. So don't <laughs> overdo it. That's what I found out. Here are some of the things. If I was uh, giving this a month later, I'd have more of these things blooming. Here are some of the things that I'm just going to just run down and talk about briefly. Um, the trailing red snapdragon. I used the trailing pink one last year, and I just thought it was wonderful. It got tall and wide in my planter, lots and lots of bloom, and I snipped it off as it went along. I want to encourage you to sometimes think about some houseplants. I, reason I have, I don't have houseplants. The only houseplants I raise are orchids, and so for me to end up with these, I bought these to do some tables at the church, and I took water picks and stuck some carnations in it. So I ended up, I made a planter for my daughter for her house, because she has houseplants, and, and I will probably use this. This is a Schiffelaria. It's a small one, Schiffelaria, that's little and small leafed, but I don't know how tall it gets. But I'll probably put that in one of my planters, so who knows what it'll be like. This is what I've talked about earlier. It is beautiful when you put it where you've got the pink and the gray. Do I have my, here's a gray one. Another. It is, is very, very uh, flashy looking when it's with the right color. By itself, it, uh, it didn't, compared to the margarite or others, that's the sweet potato plant. This is the trailing verbena, and mine was, was red, and this one is purple, which I couldn't get the red. I think I would like last year's better, but we'll find out. And here's another trailing. This is the one I had last year, the snapdragon, that's red, and it was just very, very successful. This is my impatience this year. I didn't go and get my little plugs because I happened to have a volunteer that came up in a husk, in an orchid. And it grew all summer and I thought, oh, it won't grow. I only water it once a week. And I put it in the house and it, kept, it was huge. And I thought, oh, I'm just going to do cuttings of it. So I did cuttings for my uh, impatience this year for my planters. And then they called me. I usually use these at my church to decorate tables for a lunch in the first week in May before I put them in my pots. They said, we're going to have it the 5th of April. I thought, well, good. This is the year I already have plants. Yeah. I haven't. When you find it, get instructions that when you take a little seedling, you should put it in a 
little pot until it gets big enough, and the roots go down at the bottom, and then put it in a big pot. One year I tried putting them directly, the little, the little seedling directly in here, and I did some the other way. This one did much better. It grew much better if it was a little confined before. These, once the roots show down here, will be ready to transplant into the bigger pod. This is a geranium I found that I just think is going to be great. It's called Persian Queen, and if you can see the color of it and the leaf, it, uh, it, I've not seen it around here. It was growing at the Quad Cities, and the uh, lady loved it, and she took a cutting of it and brought it to this uh, greenhouse, and, and they're growing some of them. Uh, the coleus that I like a lot is this pink one. So who knows what that's going to go with. And this is not a coleus. It doesn't bloom. And I don't know, I think a kid must have named it. The, it's a Magilla perilla. I think it's just a perilla. The Magilla, I don't know what it is exactly. <laughs> so this is what's fun to just go along and buy something you've never heard of. Read how tall it gets and what it takes for sun or shade and give it a try. This is a new guinea hybrid. I've never found the new guinea hybrid uh, in patients to bloom as prolifically as the others. But it's a good color. And I thought we'd try and see what we thought of it. But see these, you're putting these together. And then this is, a, um, this is that Angola. The thing that I had that was purple and white at the end that got so tall, this one is called Angola Blue. And I don't know how I'm going to use it, but I hope I have better luck than I did last year. If you've uh, ever raised the icicle Heliochrysum, Heliochrysum is the licorice plant. I had this last year in several of my beds, and it was just beautiful. It said it, it gets, um, um, it spreads 18 to 24 inches. Well, I don't think it did that. It got, for me, about 12 inches high, and there were several branches on it. But it made a very, very nice contrast with the rest of your plants. This is something that I didn't like. The, it was the only one that was blooming. I didn't like the orange. It's called... Osteospermum. And uh, they come in a lot of colors. Hot pink was not blooming, or I would have bought the hot pink. This one is orange, and he, of course I bought it because he's blooming, and he quit. I bought him early in the week. <laughs> so much for that good idea. For a couple of things that would be uh, good for your hot sun, is, this one is the ice plant, which is hot pink, and it would be... I, uh, it would be good to put in a um, trough garden, as this one would be. This one is portulaca, and I have grown both of these in a little, little pots on my front uh, sidewalk where it's just very, very hot all day. Here's a plant I've never heard of I'm going to try. It's called fan flower, and it's <coughs> zigzag. It's supposed to be, there are petals only on one side of it, and uh, lavender. So I don't know what it'll be like. And I think that's it. The, the problem giving a talk this time of year, most of your nurseries don't have any plants in. And so I had to go to greenhouses that raise plants. And those two, uh, between Iowa City Landscape and um, green, uh, Joyce's Greenhouse, were the only places that had plants this time of year. So I got a nice selection of different things. But they weren't very many of them blooming yet, because they're little. I think... You can find lots of plants if you go looking for them. And it's fun to try new things. So I hope all of you got some ideas of things you want to grow in your planters. Thank you, Mary Lou.